Okay, so some PMOX stuff. This is probably the last section I'll be able to cover. So we've got a patient who walks in with microcytic anemia and this smear and these labs. So the MCV is 70. It's kind of low. Uh, low iron, high TIBC, low retix, RDW, and ferritin. So that's iron deficiency. What if um, we've got the same smear and the only thing that's different is the TIBC is low? Now we're worried about chronic disease for number two. For number three, check out this smear, and the MCV is super low, 60. What? Thalassemia, absolutely. So thalassemia is characterized by a really low MCV, and what is the significance of the low RDW? Yeah, there's little variation, right? If it's a genetic defect, all the red blood cells are going to be affected by the thalassemia, whereas... Um, in, in another cause, there might be more retics, so there's going to be greater variation in the size of the red blood cells. Uh, so what about this little microcytic friend, 70 MCV? The iron is actually high, low TIBC, high ferritin, and this smear. Can you see it well on this, this thing? It's sideroblastic anemia. It's sideroblastic anemia. So this one, you'll see ring sideroblasts in the bone marrow, which we can't see on the smear. Um, and other things that might help you in the clinical vignette, isoniazid can cause sideroblastic anemia. So they might tell you that the patient was on INH for tuberculosis. Okay, so for macrocytic anemia, if you see one of these dudes, what's that? It's a hypersegmented neutrophil. So what if this is your vignette, high MCV, high homocysteine, but normal methylmalonic acid? That's folate. What's up, step one? Okay, so that's folate. What if both homocysteine and methylmalonic acid are high? That's B12. And they might give you neurologic symptoms also. Uh, if the MCV is, is high and you've got one of these dudes, this is called an acanthocyte. Remember that from Nan Claire? What would cause that? Liver disease. So liver disease is another cause of macrocytic anemia, and acanthocytes on a smear help us out. I'm going to tell her y'all didn't remember. Okay, so um, what if the MCV is normal, but LDH is high, so is indirect bilirubin, and the haptoglobin is low? What are we worried about? What would cause high LDH in the blood, high indirect bilirubin, hemolysis? So these are all um, cases of hemolytic anemia, a sickle cell kid with a sudden drop in hematocrit. Um, that's an aplastic crisis uh, or a sickle crisis. So uh, the causes for that are either hypoxia, dehydration, or acidosis. If um, you have cyanosis of the fingers, ears, nose, uh, and maybe had a walking pneumonia, cholagglutinins, and the destruction of the blood cells are due to IgM, uh, immunoglobulins, if there's a sudden onset of hemolytic anemia after you take some drugs, penicillin, cephalosporins, sulfas, warmaglutinins, warmaglutinins. So uh, G6P can be precipitated by sulfas. Um, yeah, so that's really not fair. I was trying to get at warmaglutinin disease here. It's caused by either a drug reaction or an underlying malignancy. And the difference here is instead of IgM, it's mediated by IgG. So if the spleen is big, there's a positive family history of this type of illness, uh, there's bilirubin gallstones, the mean cell hemoglobin concentration is high. Yeah, hereditary spherocytosis. you got to treat that by taking out the spleen. If they're complaining of peeing really dark when they first wake up in the morning, they might have Bud Chiari syndrome for clots in the IBC. PNH, yes, paroxysmal nocturnal, nocturnal hemoglobinuria. And from step one, that's a defect um, in, yeah, whatever. I don't remember that. Okay, so here's, here's the one you were trying to get at earlier. Sudden onset of hemolytic anemia after permaquin, sulfa drugs, or fava beans, which I had the other day. They're delicious. There's our G6P dehydrogenase deficiency. Okay, so with thrombocytopenia, 
uh, low platelets on our on our CBC. If it's a young woman who's got recurrent epistaxis, um, really heavy menstrual bleeding and petechiae, and when you do the CBC and all the workup, the only thing that's low are the platelets. That's what? ITP. ITP. So prednisone is medical management, splenectomy if that doesn't work. Uh, what if it's a, a young woman with recurrent epistaxis, heavy menstrual bleeding, petechiae, but the bleeding time and the PTT are high? Ooh, um, not DIC, von Willebrands, yes. So why is the PTT high in von Willebrands? Yeah, because von Willebrands is bound to factor eight. Very good. So now I've got a 20-year-old male who's got recurrent bruising, hematuria, hemarthroses, elevated PTT, and we correct it with mixing studies. Hemophilia. What's this mixing studies business? It means something's deficient, right? So if you've got a problem with PTT and you mix it with normal blood and it corrects, that means something was missing in the patient's blood that you added when you mixed. So that's what a mixing study does. If you have a mixing study, you've got an elevated PTT, and then you put in normal blood and it still doesn't work, that means there's an inhibitor that's present. So even if you add the factor, the inhibitor in the patient's blood is going to screw it up. Uh, so <laughs> our fourth patient is a 50-year-old meditarian, just finished two weeks of clindamycin, has hemarthroses and oozing at his venipuncture sites. Vitamin K deficiency. I thought I was being tricky, but you guys got it. Right? He's a meditarian. He doesn't eat any vitamin K-rich foods. And he took clinda, so he wiped out all his gut flora. He doesn't have vitamin K. Um, what about a 50-year-old beeritarian with severe cirrhosis and thrombocytopenia? So why would liver disease cause thrombocytopenia? Yeah, because your liver makes your factors, right? So if your liver's shot, you're not going to make them. What's the first one depleted? Seven. And so the PT, what that means for us clinically, is in early liver failure, the PT is going to rise first before the PTT, because factor seven is the first one to go. And the two factors not depleted in liver failure because they're made in the epithelial cells or endothelial cells, eight and von Willebrands. So they're not made by the liver, so liver disease doesn't affect them. Okay, so we'll go through a couple more slides, and then it's going to be 9 o'clock, so we'll have to stop. So um, if a patient walk in, walks in with thrombocytopenia and this, that's scary? What is that? Schistocytes. So that's scary. And if the PTT and PT are both high, fibrinogen is low, D-dimer and fibrin split products are high, there's your DIC. So what causes it? Sepsis, right? LPS from gram-negative sepsis, some OB stuff, some other things. Oh, when you treat M3 AML, remember that? The hour rods, that causes DIC. Snake bites. Don't give it by a snake. Okay, so there's some of the causes. The treatment, not much works, right? you got to correct the underlying factor. You can give FFP to replace the fibrinogen. You can transfuse platelets in this scenario. But really, unless you correct what started this whole thing in the first place, you're kind of toast. Um, if the PT and the PTT are normal, but we still have the smear, TTP, good. We just talked about it. So HUS or TTP. And the causes of that, O157H7 causes um, HUS, and then there are some drugs that are associated with TTP. The most important one for you is going to be teclopidine. And then the treatment, do we want to give them platelets? No? What do you want to do? Plasmapheresis. Good. So if you're going to go into pathology, uh, TTP is like one of the only things they'll pay you for on the weekends. Little known fact. Okay, so um, seven days post-op, a patient develops a clot in their artery, one of their arteries, and the platelets are low. So low platelets, but clots. Heparin, yes, HIT. So post-op, they've probably got heparin during the operation. That's going to cause HIT. The mechanism is an antibody that binds to um, heparin and the PF4, and we treat it by stopping the heparin and... Um, Start leporudin. That's the anticoagulant of choice for that. And in somebody who has a thrombus that's unprovoked, you always want to think about cancer, especially if they're old. Lupus anticoagulants, 
Um, you would see high PTT. They might have a history of multiple spontaneous abortions and a, pos- a false positive syphilis test. For protein C and S deficiency, that's where you see that really nasty skin necrosis after warfarin. And we had a picture of this on my uh, medicine shelf. They gave you like a really nasty, like awful bruised looking nasty thing. And uh, it was after you'd given a warfarin and they asked what the mechanism was. So it's protein C and S deficiency. Factor V lighten is the most, most common cause of um, hypercoagula- a hypercoagulable state. AT3 deficiency is important to you because heparin won't work in those patients with AT3 deficiency. Um, and then estrogen, we can't give that to women if they're old and they smoke because they increase risk of clotting. And nephrotic syndrome, we already talked about that mechanism. We pee out our clotting factors, um, and it puts the patients at risk for renal vein thrombosis. So I think it's nine, so we should probably stop. This was my last section, and I'll post it so you guys can look through my slides. I tried to make it pretty self-sufficient so you can use them to study. But it is nine, right? I can't really see the clock. Yeah, I don't I don't want to keep you late. Yeah, no problem. I'll be here for questions if you're bringing